This episode is sponsored by Axelar Foundation. Axelar is scaling interoperability to connect hundreds of new blockchains anticipated in the Ethereum Layer 2 ecosystem. Find more at axelar.network slash Layer 2. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at at The Block, and I'm very excited for today's episode because we have a co-host joining us, so that kind of takes a little bit of the workload off my shoulders, off my chest. So I'm pleased to uh, introduce Sergey Gorbanov. Thanks so much for taking the time to conduct and host this conversation with the founder of Egan Layer and the director of the University of Washington's Blockchain Lab, Shiram Kenan. Gentlemen, really appreciate you taking the time to join the show. Maybe we can start at a very high level uh, of what you guys are working on, your seats, and Maybe just break down this. This will will do quickly, just to give people a little aperitif of what Egan Layer is and what Axelar is. Yeah. Um, hey, Frank. Hey, Sharam. Uh, great to be here, guys, uh, doing this with you. So, Sergey, I'm one of the co-founders of Axelar. Um, what we do at Axelar, we connect different blockchains, different layers, trying to keep the ecosystem as connected as as possible as we as we scale it, um, uh, kind of horizontally through different applications and uh, different layers. Beautiful. Hi, um, hi, Frank and Sergey. Thank you so much for uh, making this podcast. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Shreer. I'm founder of uh, Eigenlayer. Uh, Eigenlayer is a mechanism for programmable trust. So, you know, underlying all the blockchains is, uh, you know, some root of trust. In Ethereum, for example, it's staking. You stake a bunch of ETH and then make a promise that you're going to run the Ethereum network correctly. Eigenlayer expands this and makes it permissionlessly programmable. So what we're building is a mechanism for programmable trust where, you know, anybody can come and deploy arbitrary networks on top of the trust network that underlies Ethereum. The same stake, the same operators, but you can run arbitrary networks. Every new network doesn't have to go and build their own separate, you know, staking and a separate um Trust network. So you can you can think of Eigenlayer another way is as a marketplace for decentralized trust. So you can stakers and operators are creating decentralized trust and they can sell it to applications that want to consume it. Perfect. Well, this is super exciting because it's actually the first of, of several parts where we're going to be diving into the market of decentralized finance and really get into the granular granularities of um many different blockchain ecosystems, how they work. So a bit of a diversion or um, a detour rather from the usual market punditry that we revel in here on the the show. And so I'm very appreciative of Sergey to sort of help me with with tackling that beast um, as it were. So, and also let me know if I say something wrong. The last show we did uh, where we talked about staking, um, given that I had a house in Sarasota for so long, I kept pronouncing it Lido, because of Lido Key, apparently it's Lido. So if I mispronounce anything, feel free to to basically shame me for it. But anyway, if let's skip, start with... If we forget, the audience will correct you 10 times. So don't worry about it, Frank. <laughs> I know. They, they're, they're ruthless. Our Scoop listeners, they, I get phone calls from some of them sometimes. I actually got a very lovely text from a, a married couple that listens to the show. They say they start their mornings um, with coffee in the Scoop, which, you know, I think that's, that's a testament to a true, long-lasting uh, life together that they will have. Anyway, so let's think about the state of development in Web3 and and maybe Ethereum more specifically. There are many early internet analogies that we see. Where does it need to be developed? Um, where do we see commercial applications being developed? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I'll set a little bit of, you know, the stage as well, right? And maybe pass it to kind of Shiram. I think if you take a step back, like where the... Ethereum is, right, and whether or not it's even ready for kind of commercial applications. I think there is, um, you know, an argument to be made that it's not quite ready yet, right? And I think that's, um, Mm. you know, definitely a lot of the inspiration behind some of the work we do, you know, some of the work I think Shriram does and the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem, right? Kind of how we got here is, you know, Ethereum gave us the chain for allowing to program anything we want, right? In a composable, in a unified, in a, you know, environment that anybody can trust on, 
but we very quickly saw a lot of scalability issues right with it and various approaches you know outside of ethereum were taking were taking place to kind of solve the scalability issues but i would say over the last you know year plus plus minus we have seen people kind of you know go back to ethereum ecosystem and trying to figure out how do you get that to be ready for the prime time applications you know, on itself, right? So I think Vitalik had a, you know, a couple of blog posts that he wrote um, in terms of layer two kind of scaling roadmap for Ethereum, right? And I think, you know, some of the work that, you know, Eigen, uh, layer and, uh, you know, layer twos, kind of layer threes, what they're trying to do is kind of continue innovating on that and continue to figure out how do we scale, you know, Ethereum, right? Um, and that in turn means introducing a lot of modularity into the stack. Right. Um, and, you know, fragmentation that comes with it. So kind of, Frank, I guess without answering your question, you know, what applications they are, I think, you know, the bigger theme that I think the whole Web3 industry is going through right now is like, how do we build the stack? How do we get there? How do we get to the point of having exactly. widespread consumer yeah, yeah. applications? Exactly. Because you, you saw throughout the last, you know, bull market, right? Like still gas fees were enormous, right? You know, people were paying like ten, tens or hundreds of dollars for transactions. And like, you know, that's not the way to kind of keep on growing. It, so with it unique, became the rich man's, it became the rich man's chain. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I guess on that, maybe I'll pass it to Shriram, like to tell like his thoughts of how you see, you know, kind of modularity, right? Like how do you see different layers evolve around Ethereum and like, What's what's the need for them from from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one way to think about this is when any area kind of begins, you see a highly integrated kind of a solution, right? Like you know, when you build the first motorcycle, you don't know like that. You know, there are tires, there are spokes, there is like you know the body. There's you know you have to paint it. Every, one guy or one group of people actually have to do everything because you know, it's immature, the boundaries and layers across these different things. There's no standard standardized tire size. There is no interoperability across all these different parts. So you have to have, rely on an integrated system. And that's how Ethereum was originally built. And, uh, you know, some of the issues that uh, Sergey just laid out, which is on the scalability uh, you know, Vitalik identified under the Ethereum Research Foundation, and several researchers basically um, identified that one way to scale it is actually to separate the data plane and the compute plane. And the idea here being that, you know, if I can kind of do computations off chain, but prove that the computations were done correctly, and then... No, now I publish just the inputs or outputs of these computations so that other people can, you know, if they want, they can verify it. This is one way of actually achieving scaling. And it turns out it's much easier, at least conceptually, to scale, you know, the publication of data as opposed to the scaling of computation. So scaling of computation is coming from these kinds of proofs. And there were two, like, major categories of proofs. One is optimistic, or I should say, rightly, crypto-economic proofs, where you make a claim and then you put up a deposit and say that if you do this computation, this is the output. And anybody who doesn't agree with it can put up a bond and then, you know, only when there is contention, it kind of gets executed on chain, right? It's kind of like a court system. You know, Sergey and I, as private individuals, can engage in contracts. And unless the contract goes sour, we don't need to go to the court system. So... That's the basic type of the crypto economic or optimistic rollups. And then you have the validity proof or ZK rollups where I submit a cryptographic proof that the computation was indeed done correctly. So these two mechanisms help scale the base layer without actually kind of scaling it. But the base layer does need to publish all the inputs and outputs of this computation because somebody wants to challenge the computation. They need to have access to what is the input on which this computation was conducted. So that leads to this like data publication or data availability problem where well do you publish the data and you could publish it inside ethereum and then but the ethereum data bandwidth becomes a bottleneck so so that's the scaling roadmap and then like there is like how do we scale the data bandwidth on these uh, systems uh, using you know scalable data publication methods so that's 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 where the ethereum roadmaps headed and from 
what we realized is actually like a complementary problem from the viewpoint of Eigenlayer is, hey, there are lots of ideas, you know, both Sergey and I here come from an academic background. And one thing, you know, you can observe is the translation pipeline from like the scale of ideas and protocols that are in, you know, in the academic or even like in the industry uh, world with uh, the level of prototypes to where actually things stand. There's a huge gap. And especially in systems which have like high scale of adoption, like Ethereum. And if it's, and part of the reason is whenever you come up with, you know, a new idea on how to build a new distributed system, you have to go and build like a whole new trust network. So when you think of the modular world, right, each module, you know, I, I mentioned that compute and data are two kinds of modules. But actually, if you look into it, there are all kinds of like, sub modules and specific things that one might want to build. You know, I may want to build an AI inference. Somebody may want to build a Linux, uh, you know, access. Somebody may want to build, a, you know, a, a, a database on a blockchain, like, you know, use SQL or some other things. So there's, you know, beyond the coarse granularity of computation and data, there's like all kinds of finer granularity on what sets of things because you know fundamentally that's all the cloud is just compute networking and data and just different combinations of this and there is any number of like you know we were asking for analogies from the uh uh cloud or like the web world you know if you were building a program back in let's say 95 right you know how you're you would have to build your own server you have to build your own like uh you know uh, identity you have to build your own login you have to build your own like payments you have to build your own database, and then you build your application. Like Amazon Bookstore was like this. They had to build all these things. And then over time, what we saw is, hey, let's just spin this out and let's just call this AWS as a cloud. And then like other people built lots of these SaaS software as a service solutions deploying on top of cloud, which is like, hey, this is identity as a service. This is payments as a service. This is... Um, database as a service. And then when you want to build an end user consumer application, just concatenate these things, right? Like, you know, you say, oh, I'm using this for payments, Stripe for that, MongoDB for database, or for authorization, AWS or GCP for my cloud. And then here you go, here's my... So this led to a massive rate of innovation in, in the cloud. Well, you have a red pill option and a blue pill option in, in a sense, right? If you're thinking about modularity, something maybe like... Solana, monolithic, no friction between apps, li no liquidity issues. And if modularity wins, there'll be multiple roll-ups, fraction, network, liquidity. Um, so the bet is, does everything live on-chain, um, uh, monolithic, or is it a modular world? I mean, yeah, and j just to add to that a little bit. I, I don't think it's necessarily a bet. I don't think it's necessarily a choice, right? That like it's one or the other, you know, you certainly, at least from my perspective, you know, and like, sure, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but, you know, monolithic sta stacks offer certain advantages, right? Like you have everything in one, you don't have to make any choices. So in some sense, it's the easiest thing to go and like build on top, right? Uh, like building a smart contract on Ethereum when the gas cost is cheap, doesn't take a lot of work, right? Like you can write a simple application in a couple hours, deploy it, you don't have to think about like hosting or anything else, right? And I think the challenge with that, you know, is that you um, start hitting limits of what you can do when everything is prepackaged out of the box, right, for you. And so when you, you know, have more advanced applications, when you have stricter throughput networking or compute requirements, right? Uh, or you want to customize governance or anything along those lines, then you can't just, you know, deploy everything in, out of the box prepackaged and you need more flexibility, right? Um, and, um, you know, I think in, in, in that sense, like, it's, there is almost a world where both can coexist and, you know, um, for different use cases and for, for different almost like stages of products, right? You know, I'm doing something quick and dirty. I just want to get an out-of-the-box stack, deploy it, see if there's like a, any user that's going to use this this thing that I'm building, right? Versus like I'm a later stage maybe project. And then, you know, at that point, I, I really want to kind of customize everything. I need to have control over my resources. I need to like pick pick and choose, you know, out of the best uh, what's offered in the, in the ecosystem. And that's at least my view. Curious, Firam, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean... Um 
I think uh, people index too heavily on DeFi as the only category that exists in crypto. I mean, it, it's true that maybe it's the dominant category today. But, you know, the scope of the crypto or, you know, uh, the blockchain, you know, project, as if I can say, as a community, is far beyond that. It's to build all digital platforms with, like, a crypto blockchain substrate. So do you think certain segments of the overall economy or global marketplace will find their way on maybe speci- on monolithic and certain category segments will find their way to, to modular to, to like separated more flexible you know all of these things and you know even on whether like even when people think about like uh, this this kind of integrated versus like modular architectures um, the uh, there are clearly advantages you know in, in the financial world for like uh, you know uh, full liquidity sharing and so on but it, it's it's almost when you expand the scope to all digital platforms it's almost like obvious like trivially obvious that there's no chance that that all that can live on one chain right imagine that uh, i i want to run ai inference right i want to run llms i, I want to do all kinds of things on chains and, you know, I'm going to run it on a fully red, redundant replicated system where 2,000 nodes are going to replicate all my AI inference around it. Like, it's just the premise itself collapses on its own, like, weight. So I think, you know, the, the people who say that there'll be one chain to, like, rule everything uh, are not looking, like, you know, at the scope of what the crypto project is. And And, and in my view, it's basically the coordination substrate for all digital platforms so th- that's that's one uh, one side the other side is um, you know the the thesis of one one layer which accrues like a lot of momentum uh, you know in in that case the fundamental thing is where is there like a token of value that people you know to uh, that people are uh, happy with and can use and imbue value into, right? You know, digitally native assets have to be imbued value over time. And I think there's really only two of those and BTC and ETH, I would say, are, the, are, are those two. And uh, the our the, and then because Bitcoin is not programmable, you can't build any sophisticated things as additional layers on top. And Ethereum is fully programmable. So even if the base layer is, accommodates much less throughput on its own, there are ways to build all these like complex layers on top, which can actually do a lot of the throughput. Um, so uh, our vision is like the, the eigenlayer vision is Ethereum becomes the trust layer and adjudication layer. Because if if I only have to do adjudication, which is like resolve content, like people who disagree, then there is enough throughput because contentions are rare and you have to put in money and you know, these are unlike like real codes. These are not subjective disputes. These are objective disputes. If you run this computation, what is the answer? And so like what does that mean for ETH specifically then? What does modularity mean for, for the role of Ether paying for fewer things in ETH? What are the knock-on effects there? Yeah, to, if, if I can add a little bit there, the our, our view from the eigenlayer kind of like idea is you stake ETH and you can now participate and validate any kind of module that is built on top. Instead of each of these modules necessarily have to have their own like separate token. Maybe each of these modules also have their own token and there is a kind of, we call this the dual token model, where you can stake your own token but also stake ETH because you get this larger pool of economic security which because it's shared across these multiple different modules, the cost of capital is much lower so you can actually get a, access to a much larger pool, but also have your own pool. So you're, you're not losing out on, you know, your own utility, but also you're getting this additional kind of economic backing. And this is a model we're seeing where the, the problem in our view of the purely modular world is when you have lots of modules, each of which have its own trust model, and you compose them, you try to use all of them, you're now relying on the worst of those modules, Right, because trust is always the weakest link, and whichever one is the least kind of trustworthy, you'll get broken on that thing. 
Instead, if there is a kind of like a shared trust layer on which other things can be built, it's much more like, uh, you know, composable because if I compose them, I'm not taking additional trust assumptions. So kind of a, in your model, Shiram, look at the value and the security comes from ETH as the token, right? So that's sort of the shared uh, primitive in some sense, right? Across all these different, right. across right. all these different like modules, right? Curious also from your view then, you know, but one of the benefits just to kind of counter, you know, the point of modularity is a little of monolithic change, like we said, is actually developer ease of use, right? Yes. Let's um, pretend a Solana bull was participating in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, Solana, you know, any other kind of monolithic stack, right? But um, yeah, kind of curious from your view. So, you know, your point is that, okay, from a security, we need to have a shared, you know, primitive that we can share for the security so we don't have the weakest link. Now we have a lot of these modules, so maybe um, from a developer perspective, like how do I pick and choose, right? Like it's a lot more decisions I have to make. Before I only had to choose between Solana, you know, and ETH, let's say, right? <laughs> like, you know, or some some other layer ones. Now it's like a lot more trade offs, a lot more choices that I have to make. Um, do you f- do you feel like the developer complexity is going to increase? Do you think eventually the developer complexity is going to be similar to what it is like in in Web two systems, or there is like a you know, what is the core kind of Web3 systems that allow the developer complexity to be still small? Yeah, so that, that's our, our our view is on top of like these kind of shared trust networks, there's going to be lots of SaaS-like solutions. Like, you know, these are going to be deeper developers who can break through complexity and actually build systems. Like think of bridges. And SaaS as software SaaS as a software service, as a right? service, And you can think of a decentralized version of like SaaS, a software as a service or protocol as a service running on top of something like Eigenlayer, you basically just write your protocol, deploy it, and then like the Eigenlayer system maintains a group of decentralized trust network, maintains fees and revenue and all these things. So you can actually start, and people who are building natively on something like this are tunneling through much higher complexity because they're actually writing raw distributed systems. It's kind of like the MongoDBs and like OAuths and all these types of solutions which exist in or like the snowflake and all these things that exist in the cloud era, people working at much lower level of complexity, but these are not going to be the ones who build consumer applications. I think this is one of my like mental models is where you're selling to like a consumer, ease of use is the dominant thing that that's going to matter, right? But whereas when you're selling to developers, flexibility, raw power, like, you know, rigidity, these matter because, you know, the person who wins is like the one who's going to build the best solution. It is not because it's not a, so the, the decomposition here is that there's, there's the cloud, there's SaaS, and on top of SaaS, there are consumer facing applications, which integrate these SaaS solutions. And the consumer facing devs are not going to be like programming all these like crazy, like complexity of distributed systems. They're just going to say, I'm going to use this Oracle, that bridge, this thing, uh, that AI inference tool, all of these running on properties and distributed trust systems, and I just abstract it out to the consumer developer, and then they just integrate all of these things. We are far away from like a point where such is the case, but the initial precursor of this is things like roll-up development kits, right? RDKs are like, hey, I want, you want to go develop a roll-up? Don't try to do everything yourself. Here is a kind of like, possible configurations, use this what this data availability, use that uh, bridge, use this thing, and then just options that you can integrate. And those will be where consumer applications are built. But then there's going to be this rich layer. In fact, you know, this is one of the things I think people are, you know, in crypto don't fully realize is one of the biggest growth sectors for venture capital over the last 20 years has been software as a service, right? This is people tunneling through the complexity of cloud to build business to business solutions that then other developers actually consume. This category is just barely starting, like Axelar and Eigenlayer are in this category. But this is going to be one of the biggest growth drivers because unlike other things, you can actually, people who are building each of these things hyper-specialize in building that one thing. What is the best way to bridge, right? Like that's what Axelar is focusing on. What's the best way to like obtain shared trust? That's what Eigenlayer is focusing on. There'll be people who focus on very, very narrow things and then they'll be the best at it. And then people just compose these things at different layers. So that's our thesis on, on how this is going to evolve. What's the best way to host a podcast? 
Easy. <laughs> the scoop well, is a service. Separate audio, separate video, you know, <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> gotta put it on different chains and different layers. <laughs> and then there'll be SaaS providers. There's, the, there's, 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 the, there's the future for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'll get my bill in the mail for the business idea. This episode is sponsored by Axelar Foundation. Axelar is scaling interoperability to connect hundreds of new blockchains anticipated in the Ethereum Layer 2 ecosystem. For partners ranging from Uniswap to Circle, Axelar enables seamless, universal experiences for developers and users. Find more at axelar.network slash layer 2. Well, Celestia has kind of become the poster child or the zeitgeist of modular blockchain, um, mainly attributed to its big run up in price. Full disclosure, I have a very massive bag. No, just kidding. It's, it's quite small. But walk us through what they introduced to the market and how maybe they fit into um, a bit of this conversation that we've had. I'll, I'll pass it to Shriram. I think he, you know, he has the best kind of context around it. Yeah. Um, so, so Celestia basically like identified this market need that, you know, in the roller pair, Ethereum is not going to have enough data throughput just on its own. And can we actually build a system which is optimized for data throughput? So that's, you know, uh, that's the Celestia vision. Mm -hmm. What they did is they said like, hey, let me build a chain whose functionality is hyper-optimized for data availability. And uh, so now this chain can have bridges to Ethereum. So if people want to build rollups on Ethereum, but also you can actually just go and deploy a rollup on Celestia natively. So that's the uh, that's the market uh, uh opportunity that Celestia kind of introduced. But I think even more importantly, they propagated this meme of modularity, which I think, you know, if you just look at data availability or like data bandwidth, yes. it's not something that's going to resonate with a, with a lot of people. It's a very technical, low-level concept. And by abstracting it to this concept of, oh, it's modular, which means like you're doing something separate, I think that's a really strong meme that found its way through the the memetic sphere that you live in is really good. I think they did a great job at, because, you know, we're building highly technical things. Very, very important. Memes are we important. Are, we're working on like very- Memes are important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. To get people the to understand. Market, they've done a great, great job on it. Um, but like I said, our view from the eigenlayer world on this uh, modularity is each module needing its own trust network fractures the- the trust zones into like separate zones. And it might be okay when you only need two zones, Ethereum for execution and maybe Celestia for data. But our worldview, like I mentioned, is thousands of modules. And when, when yeah, and when, I was going to say, when do you, like how far can you go in terms of zones? Yeah, so that's the thing, right? Like, you know, if we- Does it exist? Uh, to give a analogy from like the cloud era, like each consumer- web application integrates on an average 15 SaaS services in the backend. And people say, oh, you know, how are you going to have so many modules? They don't understand how the cloud works. This is how the cloud works. You have 15 SaaS solutions underneath a given like consumer product. They all operate through layers of abstraction. Like you go build a website on Shopify. Shopify itself uses a bunch of SaaS services in the backend, like layers and layers of abstraction and no code user you know, developer experience, all of these things are important, but underneath it lies this powerhouse of complex solutions that interact. Even something as simple as like showing an ad on on your website runs through this complex network of ad tech where there is like tens and or tens of solutions which may be touched on like milliseconds basis before you get your ad served. So that's the level of complexity that the internet is built on. Like, you know, so the idea that, oh, we cannot have lots of modules is not, I think, you know, commensurate with yes, what is. But I guess the, the counter to that perhaps would be, are we just going to completely take what exists in web, web two and replicate it for web three? Isn't the whole idea to make it an order of magnitude Better. Decentralized trust is, I think, the difference. And you have to build all of these on decentralized trust. That's why it's important to have shared sources of decentralized trust, because otherwise 
you have thousands of modules, it's going to centralize. So that's really what is going to happen. So that's our vision for how you can actually have your cake and eat it too. You can have a shared trust zone, but many, many people can build on top of this modules, innovate on top of this, and then they can interoperate. I'd love to hear actually Sergey's view as well on this. Yeah, no, I think like to your point, I think trust is fundamental, right? And I think that's what, you know, um, kind of the very core of the primitives. I do frankly wish the end result is that it's easier to build in Web3 than it is in Web2, right? And I think, you know, it will be a big loss if we forget about it. And uh, I do think the way to do that is by having kind of a programmability across the layers of the stack, which is not something you have in Web2, you know, systems and protocols and networks, right? So meaning that, you know, as you have different layers, if they all programmably can talk to one another through, you know, interoperability, right, through unified of these like SaaS types of connectors that Sri Ram mentioned, but they're all still abstracting everything away at the protocol layer without compromising the trust and without actually exposing this fragmentation to the end user, right, I think it will be easier to build. And I think, you know, hopefully we do end up with sort of fewer layers, right, <laughs> or layers that are easier to manage. And I think the key is really kind of a programmability across these layers, you know, kind of through the interoperable stacks along the way. I think that leads to a great segue to, uh, segue for Sergey into RWAs. And when you think about the future of grappling with all these different layers and the complexities of the underpinning chains that are touching these applications, when we have a future where an application, something like an ad might touch tens of different um, types of blockchains in some capacity, Circle in USDC almost stands as a a prime example of someone that's almost like operating five, ten years into the future in having to deal with with a lot of these complex issues in as much as USDC, right, is on top of several different chains. And and there's plenty of UI issues that that are dealt with in this current environment. But it so it raises two interesting questions, which is how are they navigating those complexities? What lessons are there to be learned from how they've done it? And how can they improve and <clears throat> how can sort of future use cases for RWAs learn from those learnings, as it were? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, just to add to that a little bit of kind of a context of like how Circle had to operate USDC. So, you know, USDC is like the simple example of RWA that we know of, right? So it's like your stable coin kind of on chain. And I think Circle originally, of course, issued it on Ethereum. But as it saw all of these other layers being added, it had to go and like reissue and reissue and reissue and reissue, right? And so what ended up happening is that while they were issuing it on some chains, some chains did not have, you know, this version of, you know, USDC. So you had like third party, like bridge providers, kind of connectors um, helping to move the USDC back and forth. Everything ended up giving it its own name with like a prefix like AAA USDC, you know, XYZ USDC. And like you have all this different fragmentation of the assets, you know, horrible UX, as you, as you mentioned, Frank, right? That, that like as a user, I have to think about different versions of these USDC. It's um, pretty bad. For, uh, it's unbearable, right? Like, you know, unless... Like there needs to be a Wikipedia or encyclopedia of like USDC formats on different chains, right? <laughs> you know, you need to go and figure out. But beyond the UX, it actually has direct um, implications for the users that are actually doing like swaps or trading, right? Because liquidity that's fragmented across different assets results in much worse like slippage, as an example, and much higher transaction fees on average, right? So users actually pay more, um, you know, um, beyond just pain and in, in horrible UX. And so kind of now the approach that they have to do is figure out what is their interoperability strategy, what is the interoperability protocol maybe that can connect all these different versions of USDC that, that exists. So they started to work on some of the CCTP, um, you know, work yeah. for the cross-chain protocol. Just yeah. this morning they announced some other work for like some other bridged version of contracts that they want to have. But um, I think they're still figuring out the, their whole like interoperability, essentially strategy. And, you know, my hope is that the next generation of real world assets 
can actually not have to go through all this <laughs> and, you know, instead rely on something more standardized, you know, like like the Axel network and the protocol um, or some of the other ones. But otherwise, you're going to be paying a lot of infrastructure costs, a lot of, you know, R&D work to kind of figure out how do I make all my RWAs be compatible with one another uh, for both liquidity and UX. And how do you do that? You do that by having interoperability protocols engraved in the systems and, you know, these RWAs, right? So, you know, imagine you issue RWA, you want to make sure that it has kind of the same address on all the different chains. People can send it back and forth across one another. The issuer can issue it, you know, on new, on new chain without having to, you know, call anyone else and like, you know, it needs to be at the protocol layer and, and support it without it. And, you know, this is like some of the work that we're helping. A lot of RWAs, um, you know, uh, with the Axela protocol is, is to do that, is have one contract everywhere, you know, have have uh, flexibility to send it across different existing chains and deploy it on, on new chains. And then on the wallet side and like the UX level, you can easily aggregate all of that and just say, this is one asset, the user has it, it may be spread across you know 10 different chains on the back end but the user doesn't have to think about it do you do you reckon that certain use cases will um like each chain will have a certain use case for that asset right like um if if you're you using usdc for i don't know specifically market making maybe the lion's share of it's going to sort of sit within that uh that that solana garden if it's if it's maybe um, if you're u- using USDC for remittances, maybe that will be you'll find that much of that uh, USDC being transacted will find itself in Tron or will it be completely dispersed? Uh, and, and then based on what do you imagine? I mean, at, at, at least in my view, right, I'm kind of curious around what you think as well. But as we said, you know, today we're still focused on this sort of DeFi kind of use cases, right, and like liquidity. But I do, you know, want to live in the world where more things become programmable, more things have trust engraved at its core, you know, everything from AI systems, right, to, um, you know, to, to finance, to payments and everything else. And so as those systems become available on layer ones or layer twos or, you know, whatever layers they choose, I think they're going to use these assets in their own shape that's required by that application, right? So if I'm, you know, an AI agent, maybe I need to, you know, use stablecoin to pay for training the data, right? Or for inference of the data set, right? If I'm building a chain that's responsible for issues of, um, you know, kind of a mortgages on chain, then maybe I use like USDC for a settlement, right? And some other functions behind it. So as these use cases find their uh, deployments, the underlying sort of stable assets or real world assets, I think, will find their own you know places within those ecosystems. But um, yeah, curious, Ram, what, what do you think as well? Yeah, I mean, this is an open question, but um, I, from our viewpoint, I think the the idea is that uh, there'll be specialized zones which do like specific functionalities and. These inside these zones, the 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 reason I'm not calling it chains is they may be layer twos, they may be like some combination of layer twos and layer ones, they may be restaged with ETH. This current view that this is where Ethereum ends and this is where something else begins, I don't think it's gonna last. Like it would be like a forest where mm. everything is connected with everything else, right? You know, bridging solutions are playing mm. their role. You in, got your sycamores and your yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Maple exactly. Zone. So they're all like, you know, interconnected and there are these like underlying mycelial networks. There will be like connections in the top, but there will be connections in the base layer of trust itself, you know. So that that's our view. But, uh, you know, the point is that there is certain things that need more synchronous composability. So I think that is the boundary, right? What is the kind of technical basis for requiring separation is... When you need synchronous composability, which means I need to touch this and that simultaneously, right? Those things aggregate into one zone. Whereas things that don't need that much synchronous composability, synchronous composability is expensive. This is what people don't fully explain, right? Because otherwise, why not put everything into one synchronous zone? Synchronous composability is expensive. So you are going to have zones of synchronous composability but then there will be zones of other zones with asynchronous composability. Everything will be able to compose with everything else. It's just 
some things will be synchronous and they need to be in the same zone and some things won't need to be synchronous and they can be in different zones and they can kind of share data and and, and uh, assets on a slower time scale so that's how i think uh, we think about it and uh, one of the things we want to make sure is that uh, m- the modularity doesn't mean that we have highly fragmented trust so that you know we are at the end left with much weaker systems than the ones we inherited from the cloud so that's that's something that we are very passionate about that's what that's what needs to be maintained kept intact gentlemen where where can developers uh, go to find out more, learn more about what you're working on? Um, yeah, from our side, if you go to Axel.network, uh, you know, as the starting point, you can find a lot of info. You can follow on Twitter at Axel Network and, uh, you know, find a lot of resources like developer documentation and things like that. And, uh, yeah, learn how to build in the um, really, I guess, modular <laughs> world, but still keep it unified. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, um, uh, the best way to follow us is on Twitter, Eigenlayer, E-I-G, and L-A-Y-E-R. Um, and, uh, you know, we recently announced our testnet, which has been running for the last few days uh, in public. We have, uh, you know, a complex ecosystem with stakers, node operators. Um, you know, anybody can build and deploy new services. We have built, deployed our own new service called EigenDA, which is a hyperscale data availability service designed around the Ethereum uh, rollup roadmap. So people can actually go and play with all of these things and, you know, reach out to us through our Twitter handle. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the program. We'll have to do this again sometime. Thank you so much, Frank and Sergey. Really appreciate it. Great journey. Thank you. And The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest, maybe two. Have an awesome day.